Hey everyone, it's Chad Carson, and I wanted to welcome you to another live stream. As you can see today, I'm talking about how to redefine retirement. Got a lot of fun stuff to talk about, but first I'm gonna let make sure my audio is working, all the technical stuffs going okay. Um, and if so, if you're if you're there on YouTube, Facebook, um, let me know you're there. Say hello, introduce yourself, and uh, I'd love to hear that the first of all the sounds okay, but then tell me where you're from who you are. That way I know I'm actually talking to people and not just myself. And, um, and then we'll, after that, we'll get in, get into the content. I'm going to turn my volume down on my, my computer here real quick. <clears throat> so just to tell you briefly about me, a little bit about me, my, uh, again, my name is Chad Carson. I write at Bigger Pockets. I just wrote a book actually. So here's retire early with real estate. That's where a lot of this content you're, t you're looking at today is coming from. Um, but then I also write at coachcarson.com. You can see my, my shirt. That's kind of my, my personal website. But I have a lot of fun with Bigger Pockets, and it's just such an awesome community, and we get to talk about so many cool things. So awesome. You hear me? Jason on YouTube is there. Hello, Jason. Courtney Williams is there um, from Massachusetts. Awesome. Very cool. Let me look on YouTube. I mean, uh, Facebook, see who's there. We have... Christy Sanchez. Hey, great. From Colorado. What part of Colorado? I love the state of Colorado. I was just in Fort Collins and Longmont recently. So I always enjoy that. Good place to be early retired, right? Um, so th for those of you just joining me, I'm going to be talking about how to redefine retirement. I'm going to go over some milestones that I think are really cool for us to think about. And really the theme is how to not just wait until you're uh, you know, 30, 40 years from now to actually have this concept of retirement, like to sort of redefine it and find a lot of milestones along the way that we can enjoy. And as real estate investors, we really have some awesome, awesome ways that we can utilize you know, these stair steps of goals. We don't have to just wait until the end and use our retirement accounts one day. Um, so that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, Chris Edwards is from Greenville, South Carolina on Facebook. Welcome, Chris. Derek McCrary from Atlanta. Um, so first timer in real estate, hard and afraid. I hear you, man. We've all been there. We've all been first timers. So welcome, we'll, we'll work on that. Frank Turner's from Atlanta, Nick Jones, New York City in the house. All right, good. At work, but they won't know the difference. All right, appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to take one more look on YouTube and then the Bigger Pockets page, see who we have here. Uh, Austin is here. Showman, what's up, Austin? And if you guys think this is a good topic and something you would be willing to share, to like, that would be really helpful. That's how people find out about this. So on Facebook, you can just click like or share. Same thing on YouTube. And I'm going to check in one more real quick on bigger pockets because we're doing a live stream there as well so if you guys want to chat on bigger pockets just let me know you're there don't have anybody there yet all right so let me let me sort of get into this real quick so the reason i'm talking about this is um yeah, i wrote the book the, the book on early retirement so i thought a lot about it but in my own like practice my own real estate investing one thing i noticed early on uh, i was 23 years old when i first started i just got started being like a deal finder i got out of college um, I really didn't have any money, didn't have a lot of know-how in terms of fixing up properties and remodeling and doing those sorts of things. And so I had to, had to set some goals like all of you do probably, but you know, looking at the peak of the mountain, like financial independence and having all of your rental income covering all of your expenses was really way out there for me. Like it just, it was a concept that was nice to think about, but it really wasn't practical. It wasn't something that I could, I could um, absorb on my own and make it, make it real for myself. And so I started thinking about, and you know, look, none of this is original. There's always people who you learn from, but I started thinking about what are some milestones that we can achieve along the way to this concept of re retirement, and and even more than that, how can you even redefine retirement? Because to me, I don't know about you, all of you, <clears throat> but re the concept of retirement is sort of a outmoded kind of thing. It's is something that. <clears throat> excuse me, maybe our grandparents or, you know, another generation thought about you would work at one company, you would get a pension 30, 40 years from that from now. And, you know, you'd have your life when you work, and then you have your life after work. And I don't know if it really happened that way. Like, I don't think a lot of people actually, you know, left their work and then just enjoyed their life all the time. I think for most people, it was kind of like a letdown. Like, man, I've done, I've been productive all these years. And all of a sudden, I'm in my 60s or 70s. And, you know, what am I supposed to do now? And so I think it's sort of a myth that we should think about after we reach some financial goal that then we're going to be happy, then we're going to enjoy our life. Like there's this concept you have to sacrifice and, and sacrifice your happiness maybe just to reach this goal someday. And there's no doubt like real estate investing and, and invest, investing in general involves sacrifice. But what I'm going to present to you today is like maybe there's some ways that it's kind of like climbing a mountain. 
So you're, you're shooting for the peak of the mountain, and but then along the way, you stop at these little kind of posts or these, these rest places, and you get to enjoy yourself a little bit. You get to have, have, some, have some fun and do some of those things that you dream about, those things that matter to you, and let's do them now. Let's figure out a way financially, practically, to build your investments, to build your business, to build your life around you having a really good time, enjoying it, and also contributing. Like, you know, if you're, if you have some things right now that your job's kind of like grinding you out and you want to do these other things that are your passions and your hobbies or your, you know, your nonprofit passions or volunteer passions, like let's find a ways to do those throughout your life. So that's, I'm going to get, dig into some practical ways there, but that's the big picture concept. Let's redefine retirement. Let's think about it differently. And, and so let's unpack, I'm going to unpack a couple of these or all, all six of these concepts for you in a second. But let me just make sure everything landed okay. See who else is here on YouTube. We got Kenny and New York City. Hey, Kenny. Driver Excels here. Jasper says, what's up? Hello. Uh, Courtney Williams from Florida. Uh, Alexis is from Arkansas. Awesome. Keith is from New Jersey. Welcome to all of you on YouTube. And again, if you think this is a cool topic, something that is worth sharing, I would certainly appreciate you pressing like, sharing it around. Um, hey, Chad, thanks for doing this. That's Matt Hip. Welcome, Matt. Matt Boardman here. Uh, the Adventure Life, I love that name. Looking forward to this. I'm close to at least many retirement, trying to figure out where to make the next move. Cool. Peter Wade is here on Facebook as well. So welcome to everybody. Let's dig into some of these some of these concepts. And I hope you all like the the whiteboard. Like I'm I'm totally low tech. You know we're doing live streaming, which is you know a little cutting edge. But um, I, I like the low tech stuff. I like to show pieces of paper with like something written on it and show a whiteboard. I feel like it's kind of like your old school coach who kind of draws some plays for you when you were in high school or something. So let, let's talk about these milestones. And the first milestone that I, if you can see it here, I'm gonna get out of the way, that I think about is one that we ignore a lot of the times. And, and I call it self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency. And what I mean by that, this is the stage where, at least in my own life, where you have all your personal debts paid off. So like maybe you're in a bunch of student debt, maybe you have some credit card debt, um, you know, but you, you get some of those like nagging kind of like personal debt kind of things that are pulling you down paid off. Maybe you get an emergency fund um, where you have enough cash saved up so that you're not like completely stressed that if you miss a week of work, you're going to be out, of, you know, out on the street. You know, that kind of like just kind of a financial cushion. And then with your job skills, you have some sort of consistency or foundation with your job, whether that's real estate investing, you're flipping houses or whether it's just most of us is just a full time job. Like if you've got a full time job, your debts are paid off, you got some emergency fund. It's sort of like the Dave Ramsey, like baby steps, if you've ever heard of those. It's where you're just kind of getting those first few foundational steps. Now, what does it have to do with retirement? Well, it actually has a lot to do with this new definition of retirement, because I'll give you an example. When I was 25 years old, I first started investing in real estate, and you know, the first three years were like just a grind. There was a hustle. Like I didn't know if I was gonna make it. I was flipping houses, trying to find a way to make some money. And, but about three years in, I sort of hit a stride where I was like, all right, I know I can do this. I've made some money. I think I can do this consistently. And so I, I got, and I got, I didn't have any personal debt. I had a living situation. I was house hacking. So I was kind of living cheap where I didn't have a lot of overhead and a lot of expenses, had some cash in the bank. And you know what that, what that did for me was it actually gave me options. And that's really what I think retirement's all about is just having a new set of options that you didn't have otherwise because you were always having to work a job. Well, in my case, I had options as a 25-year-old. I, I wasn't retired, I didn't have passive income, but what I did have was the ability to say no to other options. So for example, I had somebody offer me a six-figure job, and I wasn't making six figures at the time. A six-figure job is like a 25-year-old to come work in a, a real estate business where I'd travel around, do a lot of cool stuff, and I was really enticed by it, but I, I, was, I was able to say no because I would take more of my time. I lost my flexibility. And actually for me at 25 and really still today, like if I could do anything in the middle of the day for two hours, I would play pickup basketball. Like that's, that's my thing. So are there any other hoops people in the, in the crowd here? Like that's, if I could just go play pickup basketball when everybody else is working from like 12 o'clock to two o'clock in the middle of the day, like that's awesome. That's, that's my definition of just living life. And I did that at 25 years old, not because I was retired, but because I'd hit this self-sufficiency stage where I could say no, like I could say, no, I don't need that. I've got my bills taken care of, good to go. So is there anybody else who's kind of hit that kind of, who feels that or has hit that kind of stage? I think we, it's, our tendency is to climb, climb, climb. We shoot right past self-sufficiency and forget about the fact that that's, that's actually a big deal. So a lot of you might've 
already hit that and you ought to pat yourself on the back a little bit and maybe think about you know what what practical way could i leverage that self-sufficiency that i've built to make myself happier to enjoy my life a little bit more so that's let's think about that one so as you're climbing this mountain remember that's my metaphor we're like climbing this mountain towards the peak of financial independence but there's some other plateaus along the way we're going to keep on going from self-sufficiency and we're going to go to this thing called mini retirement which is my favorite other other than house hacking i think i i preach about uh many retirements probably more than any other subject and here's why um when i was in, in 2009 so i started investing in 2003 so it was like six years later um, i hit this stage this kind of milestone where i did have some rental income coming in it wasn't like i was again i wasn't fully financial independent i didn't have enough income to cover all of my expenses but i was at a pretty good stage where i had at least some money coming in to cover part of my expenses and I saved up a lot of cash. And my wife and I in 2009, we didn't have kids yet at that point, we took a four month trip where we just took off, like press pause on our lives, press pause on my real estate business. She uh, negotiated a, like a kind of like a sabbatical, an unpaid sabbatical from her teaching job at a local community college. She teaches Spanish there. And so we both like just pressed pause and we left and we went to Peru, uh, lived with like a family and I learned to speak Spanish. We backpacked around to Patagonia and Southern Chile and Argentina. Um, you know, I see some people like Patagonia and Chile, so maybe you've, you'd like to do that as well. And it was just a really awesome experience. And then we, but, but the point was like we weren't, we weren't, we hadn't arrived yet. Like we financially, we still had a lot of climbing to do, but this idea of taking many retirements is actually something I got from a book called uh, The Four Hour Work Week back, I read it back in like 2006. Does anybody else like that book? It's been, it's been around for a while. Um, but it was the, the concept he talked about in that book was, you know, you're, you're using your money, your business in order to leverage that to do these things that matter to you. And taking many retirements is a, it, for me, is a much more interesting way than putting off that trip and putting off those things until 30 years from now when, you know, is anything guaranteed? Like, is my health still going to be there? Is, am I, am I still going to be interested in that? Is Patagonia still going to be the same? Are they going to be, you know, overdeveloped or something? Um, and so that's, that's, that's the idea there. And, and many retirements, um, somebody, the, the Adventure Life said, great read. You like that one as well. Um, and so the, the point is, isn't that you need to travel, although like travel is a really common theme with many retirements. Uh, I've known people who like their, their mother or father of several kids, and they just wanted to take like three months just to be at home with their kids. Maybe they wanted to spend more time with them. Uh, maybe you want to go um, become a real estate investor. You just want to take time off from your job. Maybe you want to go back to school. Maybe you want to volunteer. Maybe you want to do nothing. Like sometimes we just need to, we, I, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm pointing at myself here, but like sometimes we're so type A, climb, 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 let's go achieve this kind of thing that we just, we forget to sort of take a break. Like take a pause here. You know, it's, it's okay to let other people climb you. Like this isn't a race to the top of the mountain. Like just because somebody else is, um, you know, has 50 properties and you only have one doesn't mean you're like less of a person because of that. And so like, I'm, I want to encourage you to say, like, look at your own life and say like, what do I need? What does my family need right now? And always ask that question first and then build your real estate business around that. Because real estate investing is just a tool, you know, money, money is just a tool. It's an amazing tool. It's like a power tool, but like all of this stuff is, is where it's at. Like this is, this is the important part that most of, most of us got into this thing in the first place. Um, so Tommy Stover on Facebook says that uh, their, his family is pondering a sabbatical year. That's awesome. Do you have any idea what you would do, Tommy, if you, uh, if you do that sabbatical, which I hope you do? Um, I'd love to hear what you guys are contemplating. Um, so let me know on, on Facebook. I'll check it out. Uh, Gal and YouTube says uh, she's from Denver and just moved to Louisville, Kentucky. Welcome. Uh, Kenny says, put me in, coach. I like it. All right. That's, my, that's a good theme song. Maybe I need to start the live stream with that, right? Uh, let's play boss. Almost there. Uh, Austin uh, Showman says, takes courage. Haven't had taken the leap yet. Yeah. Yeah, it de definitely takes takes some courage to do any of these things. And, and a big reason why, and I'm, again, I'm speaking like I'm not perfect here either. Like I have a lot of self-doubt. Like when you start taking yourself out of that situation where you're climbing, you're building wealth, and you have friends who are like doing that, and you look on bigger pockets and, oh man, that guy just bought 20 properties and here, and he's 22 years old, like he's already retired by the time he's out of college, you know, isn't that great? And here you are in your 30s or 40s or 50s and you're like feeling bad about that. Like that's the most difficult part to me. Like it takes courage to say, you know what? Like I'm not that person, here's where I am, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm doing all right. And having a big picture plan 
that is going to achieve your goals. Like you're going to achieve your financial goals if you're persistent, you keep after it. But what I found is if you take these pauses, at least what I found in 2009, when I came back, like I was so energized, I was so ready. And by the time I got back, I accelerated and did even better with my wealth building because I built, I built some like some energy and some enthusiasm that I had missed before I left. So I'm, I'm willing to bet some of you might find the same thing, that you kind of reignite some of your passions, some of the things that you hadn't done in a while by taking a mini retirement. Um, Tommy answered my question on Facebook. He said, we are doing a mix, uh, six months at home, six months on the road. Awesome, that'd be fun. Uh, six months overseas somewhere, and we have dogs. He has two dogs, so uh, doing most of the time in the USA. That's awesome. You know, I, have, I know people who do these RV trips around the US, and like go to every national park, take their dogs with them, their cat, their kids, you know, pile into this RV. Um, I better make a good movie, a good reality show, right? Just to see all the experiences, good and bad that you would have. Um, but for kids in particular, like I have a five and a seven year old kid and we just recently went on a, you could call it a mini retirement again, it was 17 months in Ecuador. And we just left our lives here. I still had rental properties and I'd be happy to talk on another call about how we like ran our business while we were abroad and what the systems look like. Um, but for the most part, I was focusing on, you know, our family and our kids in Ecuador and they went to local schools. And, and the point was like going with your family, if you have kids, can seem intimidating at first, but it was the best thing we could have ever done for our kids. I mean, it was like they, number one, they just got to spend a lot of time with us. And every day, you know, we're eating meals together and I'm walking our kids to school and I'm there when they get back from, from school. Um, but, and so they're going to remember those things. And yes, they want to, you know, you want them to know that you work hard and try to climb and do, uh, achieve things. But like you being there, at least in my experience, is one of the, one of the big things for kids at any age, really. Um, and so that's, that's my experience with many retirements. You know, I just want to throw that idea out there. Probably you might have heard of that before. But I just want you to know, like with real estate, it's very possible. You can do it. You can, you can get a certain number of properties. You can kind of take a break. You can take your mini retirement. You can come back and start working on your, your build, wealth building again. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to lead, read a couple more comments here. Uh, Tommy Stover says, yes, would love another call on your business systems and how you manage remotely. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm, I'm taking notes. Let me take notes on what I need to do future calls on. If you guys have any other ideas, things I'll talk about here, um, I will be happy to come back and do some other live streams if there's, there's demand for it. Uh, Kevin Stewart says, never compare yourself to someone else. It's not a race. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, it is tough though. Like, I mean, I have a hard time with it myself. <clears throat> okay. Zach says, Hey Chad on bigger pockets. He says first time as well. Cool. Welcome you too. Um, let's see if anybody, anybody else on YouTube has a comment. So Jessica says for me, the hardest part is to find mentors willing to share and educate newcomers. Yep. Um, I've, that's part of why I'm here. You know, I'm bigger pockets is, has been a huge help for me as an investor. And, you know, I've, I've always still got things I want to do and climb and get better financially and with real estate, but I like teaching. I like sharing. So I hope that, hope that shines, shines through that, you know, virtually, you know, it's nice when you get somebody in person locally, Jessica, like I, I think local mentors are your best bet if you can, but you know, look, not all of us have family members or local mentors. And so going online to bigger pockets and meeting people there and networking with people there, going to these live streams, chatting with people like that's, that's the new reality of networking and social and mentoring from people. So I think that's, that's helpful in addition to getting local mentors. <clears throat> okay. So Austin Showman has a really good practical questions. So talking about many retirements he says, what is the amount or the range you shoot for amount of money do you shoot for, for a mini retirement? Um, so I'll tell you two examples. Cause I'll, the one I just took in 2017 and 18 was, I was a little bit further up the mountain and I had, enough rental income to sort of cover our normal expenses at that point. So I, I sort of was in either early retirement kind of mode probably. Um, but my first mini retirement in 2009, I did not have enough rental income. I, I had about, I think about 1500 bucks a month coming in uh, every single month for my rental, net, net, net for my rental properties. And we had, you know, my wife and I were pretty frugal, but three to 5,000 bucks a month is sort of what we would look for while we're in the U.S. And when we traveled, we knew for four months, we estimated about 20 grand was what it would cost us to, to um, pay for our flights, to buy hotels, to pay to go to Machu Picchu. We hiked for four days on the way to Machu Picchu and, and Inca ruins and uh, Peru and all these other things. So 20,000 bucks was our budget, um, just to give you real numbers in 2009. 
And so like I had some money coming in, 1500 bucks a month, so times three, that's 6,000 bucks that I knew I could count on for those four months. But um, I just saved it. Like it was just, for me, it was just like, I, I'm just gonna save the money like I'm buying a car. So instead of me spending 15 grand or 20 grand on a car, it was just, all right, for the next year, instead of me saving extra money towards, you know, buying my next rental property or something, I'm saving extra money to take this many retirement. And that's the sort of the suboptimal thing. Like if you're just optimizing for performance and long-term wealth building and efficiency, you're going to think, oh man, that 20,000 bucks, that 15,000 bucks is just going out the door. I'm not optimizing. I'm not compounding that financially. But I'm sure that I'm presenting the other side of that is that like you always want to optimize financially, but many retirements and taking these breaks along the way, I think optimize your life in a way that you can then be more efficient later on when, you're, when you are wealth building. And also just relationships, like just when you spend time with your wife or your husband or your partner or your friend or your kids, whatever, whoever it is, um, you, know, you can't take that away. That's like putting money in the bank and it's just different. It's just like a different bank account. And so that's the way we looked at it. It was definitely money spent. But it, in, our, in our case, when you go abroad, like it depends on how you travel. But when you take slow travel trips like we did to for four months to South America or 17 months when we were in Ecuador last year, we lived on like we lived high on the hog. Like I mean, we were living in a nice apartment, ate really nice food. I like to drink craft beer. Like went to local breweries, went on traveling trips to the Galapagos, and we spent about three thousand bucks a month in Ecuador. And I know that that number sounds crazy. Like I saw New York City, like people in the house, they're gonna be like, "Yeah, I don't. I spent three thousand bucks on my rent. You know, that's crazy." And and so the point is, if you travel abroad and go kind of use some global arbitrage is what they call it. You can make dollars in the U.S. or save dollars in the U.S. and choose other places that are more affordable and that are still really cool. Like they're all over the world now. Southeast Asia, there's a lot of different places. Uh, even parts of Europe, if you go to like East Germany and some of the Eastern Europe are a little bit a lot more affordable. You can go to all over South America. I'm very particular. South America, I love traveling there to Ecuador. Colombia is not a place I haven't been, but it's really affordable and nice. Um, Argentina is a little bit more expensive, but that also affordable. Chile as well. So just, you know, if, if, if you have this idea, like you don't have to do it tomorrow, but if you just kind of keep that idea that you can do it and it's possible, then you start quantifying it and saying, all right, how much would I need? Like get on the online forums and figure out how much it costs to go to Argentina and, and start looking at plane tickets. And the slower you travel, the cheaper it will get is what I found. Like if, if you're just going on a two week vacation and going to Disney, that might cost you 5,000 bucks. But if you go on a slow trip where you can travel anytime, take a flight anytime, you can just take your time, you start cutting the expenses much smaller. And it's kind of fun, it's kind of like a game. Like, how, all right, could I go for 20,000 bucks? What can I do? Where will I go? Uh, you're not on an agenda as much as you are like a typical vacation. It's a totally different experience. <clears throat> all right, so thanks for that question, Austin. Uh, Jesse says, I've been so tight with my wallet these last two, last two years. I'm currently buying my third rental, and you convinced me to buy a video game and grind it out. Uh, to buy a video game and grind it out. It's time for a break. <laughs> I like it, man. I like it. Take a break. Yeah, you got to reward yourself, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a hard worker. Like I love working hard. I appreciate our, you know, the work ethic of so many people that were here. And so, like, but, but you also got to take a break. Hey, I see my man Mar Maurizio Rubio on here. He's a friend of mine from New York City. Also traveled to Ecuador. His parents are from Ecuador, so good friend of mine. He knows all about those many retirements, right? Um, so good to see you, bud. All right. So one other question from Peter Wade says, uh, when traveling for extended periods, if you don't have a home base in the U.S. during that time, uh, in what state or location would you recommend claiming as your primary residence for income tax purposes while receiving the passive income? Oh boy. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit. So I think the question is like, all right, what's the optimal place to have your residence in the U.S. if you don't have a home base? And um, for me, like I had a home base, so we rented our home out for two years in Clemson, South Carolina. Um, and so it just, it really wasn't an issue for me to think about like where to go. But for many people it is, you could get a home base and have a little apartment or something or somewhere in another state. Um, and, but the thing I'm not sure about, and this would be a good question for some of our bigger pockets like CPA people is what the, if you have rental income in a certain state, I think you'd still pay in most cases like state income taxes, wherever that is. Um, you, you'd not have personal income taxes, perhaps like state income taxes in some, some states. So that would be my first thought is to think about what states have ad, advantageous state income tax brackets. And um, I'd also look at uh, you know, other factors too, uh, but that, that would be a big one, uh, Peter. So if you have any other ideas you want to add to that, let me know. 
Somebody says a good game against Texas A&M last weekend. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Clemson Tiger fan for any of those who are college football fans. I used to play football at Clemson. I need to bring my football, my old football helmet for one of these calls. So I might get some boos. I might get some cheers. Who knows? But uh, that was that's part of my, my – I paid for my college. That was a pretty good, pretty good deal for me back in the day. <clears throat> All right. Um, so Jeff Carlson asked a question. He says, um, what is, do you have any tips for finding a good CPA to help your retirement? Um, I, my CPA, I look for more about who, would, who is good about real, uh, real estate. So if you look at 10, if you talk to 10 CPAs, and the CPA is a certified public accountant, for those of you who don't know, uh, there are some that are, most of them are not specialists in real estate investing. And so they're not gonna be as good at uh, depreciation and 1031 exchanges and installment sales and understand basis and what that that means for for taxes. So I would start there Um, and then, but if you have a good CPA who understands real estate, like I I consulted with my CPA really closely on a couple things. One was how my income when I'm gone, like works like, all right, I'm, I'm gone for 300 days of the year or more. There was actually some kind of weird little kind of loopholes and things that you have to look at when you're not living in the US. Um, the other thing is though, like uh, healthcare. So when I came back, uh, you really have to healthcare these days as an entrepreneur is one of the biggest issues for retirees at all of us at whatever stage we're in. If you if you work at a job and you have healthcare paid for, great. But um, you know I had to come back and uh, get back on the Obamacare healthcare exchange in my state of South Carolina, and I'm sort of at that income level where I was pretty sure we're going to be above any kind of subsidies, and so I'm paying unsubsidized 1,250 bucks a month. Our family is. Uh, for a thirteen thousand dollar deductible, and I had just been spending a lot less in a foreign country for really good health care in Ecuador. That was amazing, and so healthcare is kind of broken for a lot of reasons. A whole another conversation, but insurance is expensive. So for those of us who are contemplating many retirements, early retirements, you have to think about that when you're coming back, um, or if you have to get travel. I used travel insurance while we were gone. If you're gone for like two two months or four weeks, that's all you have to do is just get some travel insurance. And those are, there's a lot of programs for that. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my, my answer about CPAs, Jeff. But that's, those are the issues that I, I look at more. <clears throat> um, all right, so Blood Runner says, do you know Larry S? I've worked with him and he, he put me onto your website. Uh, if I knew his last name, maybe so. But yeah, you can send me a private message if you want to on YouTube or, or Facebook. Happy to chat with you on that too. All right, let's keep on going up the mountain. So for those of you who just joined me, like, this the idea here. Let me make sure the screen is working. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So the idea here is that we're trying to redefine retirement. We're all trying to shoot for this big peak of the mountain, which is financial independence, where all of your income, all of your expenses are covered by your investments, and you don't have to work at a nine to five job. Like that's that's the perfect ideal, but it's it's way up there for a lot of us. And so we're trying to live life along the way. So we talked about self sufficiency. Um, we talked about many retirements. We just got done talking about that. And I want to go over another one that a lot of you should think about, particularly as you uh, accumulate more assets, more properties, you're getting some income. You're going to arrive at this place where you don't, let, let's say your income that you need to pay for all your expenses is 5000 a month. Let's just say like 60000 a year or 5000 a month was sort of your number. Like you need to cover that in order to hit, hit your goal at the top of the mountain. Well, let's say you're at $3,000 a month and you're you're at a good place like you've got good properties things are pretty stable but you haven't yet reached where you want to get like what can you do like what is that place do you need to just keep on grinding it out and if you let's say you didn't like your job or you didn't like your schedule with your job should you just keep on going Um, my my proposal is why not consider something like a semi-retirement and so what about this like what if so you need to cover sixty thousand bucks a year so why not and and let's say you make a you know a hundred thousand bucks a year at your current job and it's it's a good paying job, but you just really don't want to be there. But you have this other job. Let's, you know, I always use the example of like teaching high school. Like what, what if you like were meant to be like a high school uh, math teacher and you wanted to coach basketball or something? That would be, that'd be my, my thing. I'd probably coach, coach basketball or football in high school. Um, and they don't get paid at all, right? I mean, they put a lot of effort. That's a really important job. But for the amount of time and effort that teachers put in, like they get paid, you know, paid squat. And so but what if, because you had thirty thousand dollars a year or thirty-six thousand coming in, you've got about fifty percent of your number covered? You could go take that job that you really like. You could be that teacher. Maybe you make thirty, forty, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars a year, and you use that income. You, 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 but you move to a job in kind of the semi-retirement type role where you're not fully retired, but you're moving. You're take, kind of making a lateral shift to a job, to a schedule, to a 
you know, something different with your work that makes you happier. Because it might take you another 10 years, five, 10 years or more to, to reach like the peak of the mountain. And do we really want to like spend another 10 years doing something that's not great when you've already done some good things and built up some rental income? So I, I, I've spent a lot of time at semi-retirement and I actually think for many of us, like this might be a place you just, you're really happy with. Like may, maybe for the next 15 years, you're happy being that teacher coaching basketball. Maybe you're happy, you know, being, um, you know, just making some other kind of move. Maybe you're staying at home with your kids for five, 10 years. Maybe that's just what you want to do. And then you pick up and start climbing again uh, later on. Like that's totally allowed. And so this, this is sort of the unorthodox thinking a little bit. You're going to, you're going to have some pushback in your own head. You're going to have some pushback maybe from work, from family who, when you say like, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. What I've been doing currently, I'm just going to take a step laterally or a step back or do something different. But the point is like finances, your real estate gives you the leverage to be able to take that semi-retirement, to be able to live a little bit differently with your, in your relationship to your job. So is there anybody out there who's done that, who's kind of be able to renegotiate with your job, with your, um, your work, doing something different because of the income you have or the wealth you have? And I'd love to hear from some of you. All right. So we've got people coming in from Salt Lake City. That's cool. Gil's here. Uh, Bill's here as well. Welcome you guys on Facebook. Let's see on YouTube. Anybody else here? Um, Jeff Carlson says, thanks. Cool. All right, so I'll, I'll wait for some of these answers to come in on, on semi-retirements and see what you guys think. Uh, just, just my example, like, so in between my many retirements, I sort of put myself in more of a semi-retirement mode because early in my career, when I first started investing in real estate, it was, you know, 60, 80 hours a week, like hustle, 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 hustle. I was a full-time investor who flipped houses and, you know, wholesaled houses and did things like that. And so like, I was just hustle, hustle, hustle. And it wasn't that after I reached some of these plateaus, I stopped working altogether, but I decided that, you know what, like I'm still gonna hustle, but maybe it's like a 30 hour a week, or sometimes I'll take do 50 hours a week, sometimes I'll do 30, I'll do 15. And so like my semi-retirement was just like toning it down a little bit. I had kids, like, you know, kids will do that to you for all any of you parents out there. Like as soon as you start like rethinking your priorities and, and, and so semi-retirement is sort of a natural evolution for me. Um, but the point is like you don't have to stop there like you can still keep building wealth you can if you're that teacher who's coaching coaching basketball you can still save money in that scenario you're still going to make 36,000 a year from your real estate you're still going to make 40,000 bucks a year from your your uh, coaching and teaching job you're going to still have money coming in maybe not quite as much as you did or maybe you can balance it out but the point is you're going to be doing something that you're you're that really fulfills you and you're happy with all right so think about that uh semi-retirement so the next i'm going to next thing i'm going to talk about and by the way like these don't have to be sequential like i've made them as if you're climbing up the mountain but it could be like you go straight from self-sufficiency to early retirement or mini retirement to traditional retirement like the, i'm just kind of presenting these as if you're climbing but you know feel free to to redo these and do them in different orders uh so glenn fonner says i'm taking a sabbatical to taco bell for taco tuesdays there you go man <laughs> that's a good choice all right, so the next step number four was really the topic of this, this book that I wrote. Um, it's, it's about early retirement. And the, the main point I'll make about that is at some point you're going to get to a stage where, like, if, you're, if you start in your 20s, for example, or you start in your 30s and you shoot for a goal like retiring in your 40s or 50s, like having enough income in your, in your 30s or 40s or 50s to cover all your, your expenses, like that's a much earlier uh, stage than most people are thinking about in the past. Most people thought 60. 60, 65, 70, like traditional retirement age is where you have to retire. Well, an early retirement is the concept is this. It's basically where you say, you know what, I've got enough income to cover my basic expenses. So like maybe you're somebody who needs like 60,000 bucks a year to cover like your comfortable expenses, but maybe like three or 4,000 a year a month, I'm sorry, three to 4,000 a month, which would be like 30 to $40,000 a year are like your basic, basic expenses. And so maybe you reach that, maybe you reach that kind of basic goal and you say, you know what, I'm just gonna take, like, I don't have to, I have, I have rental properties covering that. They're in good locations, they're stable. Like, I can just take a break. I can, I can do an early retirement. But knowing the fact that, like, I'm, if you're 35 years old or 37, like I was in my case, like, you're, there's lots of future uncertainty. Like, the healthcare could keep going up, the world could change, people could stop renting your rental properties. Like, so the, the idea is not an early retirement to, like, 
sit back on a, on a lawn chair and drink pina coladas, although like that would be cool too if you want to do that. You're still going to be diligent. You're still going to be thinking about the future. But you have enough leverage and you have enough income coming in that you can start making decisions like instead of 100% based on how much money does it make, maybe you make decisions like 10% or 20% based on how much money they make. And you just you flip that equation around. Because, you know, if we're all honest with ourselves, like even those of us who love our job, how many of the decisions we have to make on a day-to-day -day basis about our jobs are because that pays the bills, like because that's a salary. Like would ask yourself this question, like would you, what would you do differently with your job, with your schedule, with your, you know, anything else you have going on in your life if like work was completely optional? Like if you reached to the stage early in your life where you didn't have to work. And for most of us, we're gonna say, look, I, I do a lot of things differently. It might be as simple as like, I just work three days a week instead of five. It might be that I change jobs like I talked about earlier. It might be that you quit your job entirely. And so early retirement is that point where you have enough financial foundation early in your life to then start making kind of, seems like radical decisions, but they're just decisions that are a little outside the norm because you've worked hard, because you've built this wealth. And a big part of the book, um, you know, I can't get into all those like details today, but a big part of the book was like, how do you use specific real estate strategies to build wealth earlier rather than later? Like my goal in here, although if you want to like buy a thousand units and own, like take over the world and be the best real estate investor in the world, like that's cool. Like you can totally do that. But more of my point was for all of you who say, you know what, if I had five houses, 10 houses, and I just got them paid off free and clear or just in a good place. And as long as they paid me enough income, I would be totally happy to have take an early retirement right now and just, and just kind of do something different. And so like the, the book is about basically the how to, like how do you use house hacking to start doing that and then transition into buy and hold? How do you use 1031 exchanges and transition that into a portfolio that allows you to retire early? Because you know, real estate's a really cool tool, as I said earlier, but it's gotta be, have a point to it. It's gotta have a context. And the context that, I'm, that I wrote the book about and that I'm trying to live my life on is like, all right, what matters to me? Like, what do I wanna do? And how can I then build a, an early retirement, a, a real estate portfolio that gives you that thing that you wanna get out of life? So early retirement. If you guys have any questions on you know, what I, kinda how I have been using that and what it means for me, I'd be happy to chat with you about that. Um, so John Kaysen says, how, would, how could you apply redefine retirement plan to military members? Yeah, good question, John. Um, I actually have a friend who was on one of the Bigger Pockets podcasts. If you look it up, I don't remember the number, but his name's Rich Carey. Uh, he's in the military now. He's got another year or two. And he owns, he's 42, I think, early 40s. And he is about to receive military pension. So, uh, you know, you guys will know more than I will about like what the military like time limits are on when you start getting pension. But he's going to receive a very healthy pension. He's going to receive a very good health care plan, which is a big deal, as we've talked about. And then he also has 20-something uh, rental properties, free and clear, paid off in Alabama. And he lives in Korea right now for his military orders. And, and so he has that income from real estate. He has that income from pension. And he's like kind of thinking about what's next for him. Like He's writing a blog now. He's doing some other stuff. But he's also got young kids as well. And so for military members... I think you have one of those advantages is that you still have a pension available to you that most people don't have. Like most corporate workers and people like me, like an entrepreneur, like pensions are, are done. Like that's just not a thing for most of us. And so like for you guys in the military, like really study people like uh, Rich, like study his stuff and see how he balances the, the pension, the, the rental properties, like the ages, the, the limits you need to hit because you know, staying in just long enough to get that pension might be a decision you make. Uh, for other people, we might decide to jump ship on our job a lot earlier because there's a lot less to lose. But military people have some really good kind of built-in benefits. So that's the that's what I would think about, John. Um, but the other part is, you know, maybe you know, maybe I, I don't know exactly how your how your decisions are made within the military. Like if you have choices on where you can go, or if there's any options. But if you have enough money and you're building your wealth along here, maybe you can take some some stations or some. Some, deploy, some jobs within the military that you maybe don't pay as much or maybe not, but they're more interesting to you or they're, they're, you know, there's something you want to do. And maybe that's like a semi-retirement role or a mini retirement role instead of having to just do things because that's the, the money. Like as you build up your wealth, it gives you options in whatever job you are, military, whatever. You, you start having options and choices. You can start say no to that and you can say yes to that just because you have some income behind you and some wealth behind you. So that, that's my thought, John, on, on military. And thanks for your service, by the way. We really appreciate that. 
Um, Jason Miles says, what kind of task with your company are you doing right now at this retirement stage? So good question. So I, I'm, you know, no matter what, like, I don't think there's anything such thing in real estate as completely passive income. Like, I don't think we should have that because we should keep our eyes on things and stay involved. And for me, like of all the pieces of the business, like I'm not doing the, the showing rental units. I'm not doing taking calls for maintenance kind of issues. Um, I'm not doing like stuff like just I'm not doing any work on the properties like I so everything I could do now currently I could do from Ecuador and what I did was the bookkeeping so I did the basic like I have a bookkeeper who like does all my bills and enters those we use a software uh, called Buildium for our, our business it's, it's, it's a really good software for people who are have more units I would say if you have more than 10 15 units like it's build, Buildium.com is, is an awesome solution to systemize your business and do all your management functions for your rental properties online so that's Buildium. I'll probably write that on here for you guys. Bill. Buildium. Um, so I, most of my functions are done by other people, except for paying the bills. Like I still, every week on Thursday for about 30 minutes to an hour, I get all the bills on Buildium online. I go open my online banking and I pay the bills. Sometimes those are three or four bills. Sometimes it's 10. But I like to know where the money's going because as you get into your business and, and kind of step back from it a little bit, you can start seeing uh, your whole business in numbers. It's sort of like the Matrix, like any other Matrix nerds out there. Like I'm a total Matrix. I love my favorite movie series, I think. Um, but you can start seeing like the entire world in digits and numbers. Like your business will make sense. Like you'll look at a report in five minutes and if everything's healthy and good, you'll notice that it looks fine. You can kind of do a comparison reports from this month, the last month, the last month. And if it all looks kind of consistent, good. But every once in a while, you'll see an exception. You'll, you'll see something like, for me, it might be, wow, we spent $10,000 in repairs this month. Like, you know, what's that? Like, why do we do that? And I'll start digging in and asking questions and call the property manager. And that might take a little bit longer. Um, but that's, that's kind of my day-to-day, week-to-week type thing. Um, and then there's, you know, there, I say there's other people doing most of the stuff, but there's always a 5% of activities. Like every once in a while, something weird comes up. And so the property, I have property manager, a third party manager managing a good chunk of those. And then I have a kind of a team member who I train, help train, who's really awesome. And she does bookkeeping, also collections, does a lot of the turnover type stuff for me. And, and so she does most of that work, but every once in a while things come up and they don't know how to handle it. And so they got to ask me, like if there's going to be a big expense needed to be spent. And, but they would text me, they would send me, we have Google Hangout messaging is what we do. Um, but that's, that's how I spend most of my time on a week to week basis. Now there are other times, like I was in Ecuador for 17 months. And so, you know, at least once a year, I, I like to do kind of an in-depth visit of all my properties and I have a business partner. So the two of us will go out there and we'll look at like things, like, all right, that needs to be done. That, that's deferred maintenance. We need to spend some money on that. We need to you know, plan on spending money on that roof within two years. So there's always some like kind of big picture, I call that asset management type work. Um, but that's more, you can, it's more flexible. It's not like a day-to-day -day thing you have to do. It's something you need to do, but it's more like preventative type maintenance type, type work that you need to look at uh, consistently. <clears throat> Good question, Jason. Thanks. Um, the Venture Life asks, what kind of cushion would you look for with income versus expenses and reserves? Uh, that's a good question too. So um, I mentioned earlier, like you might be shooting for early retirement or maybe even financial independence where you have your, all your expenses covered by your rental income. But do you have a cushion there? Like do you, if, if you know you're going to spend 5,000 a month, do you also, you only make 5,000 a month before you say you're retired, you know, or does you need to make 6,000 or 7,000? And for me, it's like I, I, in early retirement in particular, I'm okay getting there with like kind of a thin margin because I also know that I'm in my 30s, I've got some good job skills. Like for me, I could go flip a house if I wanted to. Like I'm not doing that very much. I'm, I'm doing a little bit on the side, but I could go out and actively do some things within three months and, and I could start making money. I have my license, real estate license so I could go list some properties. So I have a lot of backup kind of plans that just kind of make me feel, could have a cushion, just knowing as an entrepreneur, I could go out and produce more income. And I think that's a really important step for anybody, particularly in early retirement, to make. You need to have a list of things that you could go do as a part-time job, knowing that you know the, the margins might be thin. You know your expenses might increase more than your income, and you just need to be able to back that up. And so that's the approach I take. Like I don't worry as much about being right on the edge financially because I know I'm also like building wealth and I'm growing my income over time with my portfolio. I also know that I could go produce more income. 
so all that said, like if you were more in a traditional retirement role and you're and you know either you don't want to or you can't because of health reasons at whatever age you are, like look, I cannot go back to work. I can't produce income. It's just not possible. You know, I think it's just more prudent at that point to build a bigger cushion, right? And and say, you know, if I have to cover five thousand a month, I need to build some extra cushion in there to make sure I've got I got it covered. So I, I think your life circumstances matter and your desire to work again. But like working again is not a bad word. I think that's the thing I want to mention. Like you, you, your retirement used to mean I'm never going to work again. Well, the, the new reality is like people are living longer. Like for those of us in our 30s, you know, like by the time we get to 70, who knows what kind of health breakthroughs are going to be made. Like it seems like the trend is to live longer. It seems like we're like, you know, you cure diseases, things happen, technology is doing well. You know, who knows? But, you know, and so we need to plan on like living longer, working longer, but the point is like you don't want to wait until that day until you have enough cushion to to never worry about anything again. Like that's sort of a financial mindset that we can insure away all our risk. We can have enough money in the bank to never have to worry about anything again. Like I think that's a little bit of a um, it handicaps you a little bit. As an entrepreneur, we always have risk. We always know what the risks are. Our job is to mitigate those risks, to think about them, to have a plan for them, and then to go enjoy life. Like you you can't guarantee everything. Like we can't guarantee we have tomorrow. And so this is a really big balance point between being prudent with your money, your finances, and enjoying life, having a good time, and which is the reason I mentioned many retirements. Like why not disperse, intersperse those throughout your life so that if you keep on climbing and keep on building more wealth, you're not like leaving behind every single goal you had for the rest of your life. <clears throat> really good questions, guys. Thank you so much for asking those. Let me look on Bigger Pockets chat on Got a bunch of windows here open. All right, so Nathan Gessner on Bigger Pocket says, I don't see any of the questions he's responding to. Is there another platform to watch this on? Yeah, yeah, somebody else answered. It's on Facebook and it's on YouTube if you guys want to watch it on those platforms. Uh, it's available on Bigger Pockets. That's what I was just looking at. So you guys can check it out on the other platforms if you prefer. Um, let me look on YouTube. I hadn't chatted, chatted with you guys in a little bit. Um, cool, so. You know, let's see, John Rice trying to get started. Thank, welcome, John. Thanks for being here. Um, Austin Showman says, if semi-retirement is working 72 hours a week trying to work towards the next house purchase, then I'm here. <laughs> You're, as long as that 72 two hours per week is not permanent, right, Austin? Like, I'm, I'm all good, like, all in, work, hustle, do that, and then, but then have, have the ability to, like, dial that back. That's At least that's my approach. If I'm having to work 72 hours a week, because somebody else tells me to work 72 hours a week and I have no choice otherwise, then that's a, that's a whole different deal, right? Uh, Blood Runner says, I'm currently saved up 30,000 in my 401k over the past years, which has given me a feeling of leverage over my current job. FU money, yeah. I didn't mention FU money earlier, but that's one of my favorite terms. Like when you got money, when you hit self-sufficiency and you got some money in the bank, it's like, hey man, yeah, this, I got choices. I can say, <laughs> say FU if I need to. And so that's, that's part of the deal. So good job, Blood Runner, that's cool. Um, let's see, Austin Showman says, do you like single or multifamily for your properties? Um, I'm more of a, I, I have both, but majority of mine are multifamily, small multifamily. And the reason being like I use those to produce more income. And so I, I like single family as well because they're so easy to manage. They're long-term, uh, really good long-term appreciation plays more so than multi-unit sometimes. And it's just single families are just a nice, I, I look at it as a chessboard. They're a nice chess piece. Like I don't want to have one big 50 or 100 unit building. I like to have a bunch of chess pieces on the board. And so like if you have a single family here, a duplex here, a fourplex there, a 12 unit there, like if things change, which they always do, you can sell that single family, do a 1031 and buy a duplex, or you can sell that 12 plex and buy five single families. Like you can, you can have more flexibility. Like I don't like being in that one position where you have one property with all your net worth I, just, that's, I think that's risky. I think that's a little bit less flexible. And so I like small multi-unit properties and single family properties. I have some mobile homes too. Um, South Carolina, you can't be a South Carolinian without a couple mobile homes. So that's part of the, part of the deal. <laughs> All right, so uh, how was Ecuador? Ashton Sharp asked, how was Ecuador? It was awesome. I'm a, I don't know if there's anybody from Ecuador or people have visited there before. I'm a big fan of South America in general, but I just, Ecuador was amazing. We spent 17 months there. Our kids went to school at local schools and we got to know all the parents of other kids at our school. Um, my wife speaks really good Spanish. I speak un poquito, yo puedo hablar, pero no perfecto. 
uh, so I can speak, <laughs> but it's, I'm still a gringo with my accent, and my kids would, it was so fun, one of the biggest highlights for me was when they, they didn't speak any Spanish when we left, about, it took a while, it took five or six months, they finally started really getting it, they got more, a few words along the way, but it, it was like, here, 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 and then bam, they started really speaking well and understanding well, and they came home, and here I was, I'd been taking Spanish, you know, 2009, spoken it before, but I just never kind of got above a certain level. And they would correct me. They'd say, Papa, no se dice eso. Like, I would use wrong words. And they'd correct me on my pronunciation. And I said, I love being corrected by my five and seven year old. This is amazing. So, if, you ever, if any of you get that opportunity to, be, uh, to watch your kids learn and grow like that, it's, it's, it's amazing. They have just, you know, cool little minds. Um, Blood Runner on YouTube says, Is it realistic to buy and live in a duplex and rent the other half out to get your housing expense close to less than $100 a month? Um, so I'll, uh, this house hacking for any of you, like I'm, I love house hacking. I talk about it all the time. If you watch Brandon Turner, he's a big house hacking guy, Scott Trench, you know, we're, we all like a bunch of the bigger pockets people that like, we love house hacking because it's such uh, an awesome concept. You, you can reduce your expenses. Like you're talking about blood runner. Um, whether you can get it down to hundred a month depends on your housing market, depends on the rent to price ratio. Um, my example, I think most duplexes, you know, the chances of you get it down to like that low on a higher cost of living area might be a little difficult, but I think it's very realistic to take a like a twelve hundred dollar mortgage payment that you would be or a rent payment that you'd be paying somewhere else, and by getting a duplex, cut that in half. Like you, you could live for six hundred bucks a month all in on a on a, in an area where you used to rent for twelve hundred bucks. Like that's very possible, and if you're really smart, if you really get a good property, if you do Airbnb and able to generate a lot of income from your basement unit or something. Or if you were like me, I lived in a fourplex building. I lived in one unit and rented out the other three, and I was positive at least 100 bucks a month, blood runner in my my case. So um, with a fourplex, a duplex, you know, it's just going to depend on the property. But I would say no matter what, like think about what you would do with an extra 600 bucks a month or an extra 400 a month, like whatever you can do to reduce your expenses, and then have a rental property if as long as it cash flows once you move out, like that's a long term asset that you'll have for a long time. And it's also reducing your expenses right now, which is just, it's an awesome one-two punch of house hacking. <clears throat> Let me get some water so you guys can actually hear me. <clears throat> Thanks for all the questions. These are great. Um, Blood Runner also says, outside of your rental properties and retirement, how is your other ventures, such as your website or your book, contributed to your income? Well, until recently, nothing. <laughs> I didn't get any. Like, I have a website, coachcarson.com, and I have bigger pockets I write a lot for. And I wrote a book for, and I haven't seen a check from the book yet. I hope I will. Um, those are sort of like retirement jobs, basically for me. Like I, I, I all my bills are paid by rental properties. Um, occasionally, I used to, you know, every once in a while we flip a house here and there, but I, I ran all my numbers based on rental properties. And we're gonna, by the way, we're gonna get back to these last two things. But I, I think the meat of my conversation today was these first four, um, and then I'll talk about traditional retirement, and I'll talk about financial independence a little bit. Um, and so, like. But, but that goes back to my point about like retirement, like the chances of you working in retirement or having some kind of income in retirement is really good. I mean, like this is a passion job for me. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys because I love it. I hope that shows through. Um, I, could be, I could be making more money flipping houses. I could be making more money buying another rental property that will make me 30 to 50,000 bucks in equity because like, I buy it below value. Like I, I, I can make money doing that, but this is, you can, when, you, when you have the money, at, at least at a stable place, Again, you can start making decisions based on like 90% passion, 10% money. Like I, I still want to make money from a lot of my passions because I have other things I want to spend money on. I want to contribute. I want to have money like help causes that are important to me. Like whether it built my wealth or not, like I feel like uh, capitalism is a really good mechanism to make changes in society. And so I think I like building businesses that are you're passionate about, that make an impact on people, and that also make you money. Like I have no qualms and problems with that. I think it's a really good thing actually. Um, Austin Showman says, what's the ratio of finance and cash that you prefer or is each property different? Um, it's a good question. Like, so big picture, I think when you first start, like when I first started rental property investing, I had about 30, 20 to 30% equity, 70% financing. So on a hundred thousand dollar property, it was like 30, I usually had about 30% equity. So sometimes I refinanced it and did a bird deal and had no cash in it. Other times I had cash in it. Um, but over time, like where I am now, I've considered like three, four years ago, we considered just paying off a bunch of our properties because we had some extra capital. I did, my business partner did. Um, but then we actually decided that for us at least, 
reducing our loan to value. So like we paid off some properties and we kept others with leverage, long-term leverage was a better play for us at our age. I'm in my thirties. I've got a long way to go. Growth might still be important. And so we paid off some and we kept leverage on some, but the overall loan to value for us is probably getting closer to like 40 to 50%. And over the long run, I'd be happy, like long-term staying, playing between 25% and 50% would be kind of a nice place for me. But I like having some properties paid off free and clear because that increases your income and reduces your risk on those properties and having maybe 70, 80% leverage on some other ones, but the balance between those two might be 40 or 50%. That's a, that's a difference between, instead of owning all your properties at 40%, 50% loan to value, I would pay off some of those and refinance the other ones and own some of them at high loan to value, some of them that are really free and clear. I think that's a better plan that I've learned from some other people than just having all of them at a really low loan to value. <clears throat> Good question. Uh, the man, is, we're talking to the man, all right, on YouTube. So hello coach, thanks for this. I've been restaurant operator for 15 years. I'm 40 years old now and my health won't allow me to do the hard work and can't find decent, honest people. So he's holding a, so he's holding some rental properties, single units, duplex, commercial, and eight units. I'm back to school to get my mechanical engineer to get the 80,000 per year cushion and work on my 401k. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think that demonstrates the point that, you know, like this is a different work environment these days. You know, like people don't work in one career, one business for their whole life. Like we're, you know, we, we do things for 10 or 15 years, we shift, we change. And, and so being an entrepreneur, like all of us have to be an entrepreneur. Like we have to figure out a way to make money a different, doing something different. We, he went back to school to be an engineer at 40. Like that's so awesome. And so whatever we're doing, I, I think that's like the mentality. It, more than rental properties, it's like that mentality of like, I can do this. Like I can learn something new. I've never bought rental properties before, but I'm gonna do this at 50 years old or 60 years old or 20, like whatever, whatever age you are. It's this, this bold idea that you're actually gonna take control of your own retirement I'm not going to depend on Social Security, although I, I'm, I think we'll have it. Like, I think most of us will have Social Security, but that's kind of a separate question. Um, but the point is, like, let's take it under our own control. Let's, let's, let's control the pattern. Let's control how fast we do it, how slow we do it. And that's that's awesome example. So thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, do you think that was a good choice? Uh, or should I keep grinding and paying off properties? No, I, I mean, I think, I don't know all the details, um, but the fact that you've built some wealth, you're now going to kind of take a lateral move and do a new career that you maybe are more passionate about that has more income. Like that's, that's great. I think that's, uh, but I might, if I was you personally, I might take like a mini retirement in between just to, uh, maybe that's what you're doing with school. Like if you could engineer a way to take four months off or two months off or six weeks, you know, whatever it is, I think that'll help you as you get back into the grind with your engineering job. But you know, all of us have different situations. Like I know that, you know, we, we, we're kind of built on a foundation of, of different, places, different roles, different everything, different, different, all of us have different disadvantages, you know, um, being a white male and, and a, in a certain in society, like has its benefits, like no doubt, like if you're, if you're a different ethnicity, different uh, gender, like that's going to be completely different. So like we all have to kind of play the role that we're given and like do the best we can where we are. <clears throat> all right. Blood Runner says, thanks. My rent's currently 600 a month. So I'm looking into what kind of property I should purchase for house hacking to get a better deal than my rent. Yeah. If you could buy like a <clears throat> you know, like, let's say you bought, if you're living in a duplex blood runner and let's say both, both sides together rent for 1200. So like 600 and 600. And it, let's say you could buy that property for a hundred thousand bucks and get a loan with a mortgage payment of four or 500 bucks a month. You could then run out the other side for 600, pay your mortgage taxes and insurance and almost be hundred percent. Like, so it just depends on the numbers, but if you're in your kind of market where you're paying 600 a rent, it might, you might have an easier chance at, covering most of your expenses with a duplex. So I'd get out there and hustle, find those properties, start running the numbers, start looking at them. And, and then that'll, that'll, that'll tell the tale. Like what this go, go start checking it out. All right, back to Facebook. Let's see if you guys had any comments there. Um, cool. So Chris Edwards says need to build luxury trailer parks in Clemson. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. The co college kids might like that. Right, right, Chris. If anybody has some ideas like that, I'm sure, you know, there's some old trailer parks around here. I bet that would be a good, a good way to do it. Uh, I'm not seeing all the comments on Facebook. Let's see if there's some more down there. But, and Rob Arias says, I agree with you currently on the way to freedom running two Airbnbs, two condos, one single family house, and two commercial properties in Ecuador. Awesome. Looking to buy multi-family property. Any lenders, lenders you can recommend, please advise. So I assume, Rob, you meant like, uh, lenders in the United States, if you're from Ecuador, or do you mean like lenders in Ecuador? I'm not sure. Uh, you can feel free to clarify which one's which. 
Uh, if you mean lenders in the U.S. and you're from a, another country, I've helped talk to a couple people. I actually met a couple people on Bigger Pockets who do uh, international loans. They have different loan terms. They're not as good of terms as like a regular old mortgage like we can get on a house that you move into. They're, they're higher interest. They're not as long of a term, but um, they're out there. So if you're somebody who has some money and you're, you're going to come and invest in the U.S. from the outside of the U.S., um, it's, it's, there's a lot of people doing it, and there's some good opportunities so I would I would kind of I would look up on Bigger Pockets International Lender International Mortgage Broker, and I know there's some threads that I found on there where you can kind of reach out to some of those brokers and check them out, see what they're like. Uh, let's see, Archana Sinha, Rob, we too invest in real estate. We are in Orlando. We'd love to meet up sometime. Yeah, so connect with some people on here and Bigger Pockets and do your due diligence and check them out. But I know I know it's a thing, so there's people doing it. Um, Topher says, should I buy a, a, build a three family home on land I have or sell the land with building plans? Uh, yeah, it's kind of, I think I'd have to get more details Topher, to, to know for sure, like what your goals are, what the next steps are. Um, and so I don't know for sure. Like, uh, buildings, I, I, I'm, I'm testing out building a house right now. I have a builder who's building us a rental property. The numbers are pretty tight. Like it's not great margins. It's construction costs are going up a lot, but um, I think it's an interesting concept. If you can get the land at a really good price, if the location's right, you know, why not build a uh, build a three family if, if you're going to keep it? Like, I don't know if you have to look at what the margins are for selling it. If you're just flipping it, you know, make sure there's really good margins and also make sure you have a backup plan. Like if you built it and it didn't sell, can you keep it? Could it cash flow? You just don't want to get overextend yourself if something changes, if the market changes, if financing changes. Um, yeah, Chris Edwards says game days will be wild in the Tiger Park. Cool. Yep, I agree. Be a lot of uh, but yeah, mobile home parks could be are great money makers. I think y'all heard but Brandon Turner. If you listen to the podcast, he has bought some, and I know some of his partners have done that. And I own some small mobile, home, little small mobile home parks. So it's it's good good money. And people, affordable housing is such an issue now, guys. I mean, finding delivering rental units at, at low prices is is just is a really difficult thing right now. So mobile homes fit that for a lot of people. Um, I think cash flow is key to retire early. That's what Topher uh, Chris says. So yeah, that for sure. Yeah, that's what rental properties is, are a little different than some of the other ways to retire early. If you're just buying stocks, you have to, you know, dividends on stocks are really small. So like living off your income is not as viable. You have to sell some of your stocks typically. So that's what I love about rental properties. That's kind of your core retirement plan is that they can pay for your expenses. Um, Jason Dupas on Facebook says, I hope I pronounced your right name right. Sorry if I didn't. I uh, currently have 38 units here in Maine. I started investing during the last recession. Today, multifamilies are selling at record prices here. Should I seek now and buy again at the next recession or hold on for the long run? I'm 34 years old. <clears throat> you know, I, I get this question a lot too, and I think about it myself. I, I kind of like the idea of dollar cost averaging. I don't know if you all know what that means, but dollar cost averaging in the stock world means you always keep buying. You consistently buy but you have a limited amount of money that you consistently invest. Like every year you're like, I, I have a hundred thousand bucks to invest. I'm going to invest this money. But when you, when you're at the top of the market, it doesn't buy as much. So like when, when the market's really hot, you're going to be very picky and you're only going to maybe buy one property. Whereas when they have another recession, you still kind of have some powder ready to, to go buy some properties, but maybe you buy three or four during a recession, you buy one during the, up, the upturn. Cause there's still deals. It's just, you've got to work really hard to find the deals. You've got to be creative. You've got to add value. Uh, you got to look in different niches, and so there's a lot more hustle involved. Um, so there's nothing wrong with sitting on the sidelines. Like if you got enough and you just want to go do something else for a couple of years, like that's fine. But I think that the difficult part that I, I find is timing things exactly. Like we all know, like in real estate, we goes at ups and down cycles. But and and I think you know most of us agree there's lots of construction now, so we're either expanding or maybe in some places we're kind of starting to tip a little bit. But I, I just I don't know. Like I think it's very hard. I, I just, I'm very skeptical of past predictions. Like if, if you look at experts in any field, they make predictions and like 10 experts will make predictions and there's always one or two that are right in, in, in retrospect, but like which ones are right, which and particularly which ones are right on the timing. And like if Warren Buffett, who he says like, he, he thinks like um, fortune tellers and people who try to predict markets are like in the same boat, basically. Uh, I, I tend to agree with somebody as smart as Warren Buffett who knows a lot more than me. And so like my approach is to be prepared for everything. Like let's be prepared for a down market because it's gonna happen at some point. It might be next year, it might be five years, I don't know. Um, so be prepared to like, we're, we're in a hot market. So like don't overextend yourself. Don't be crazy with like, ex you're using up all your cash, uh, refinance your property so that they could withstand a downturn if we get there. 
And then always look for deals. Like I, I'm always looking for deals. And if I find a good one, I'll buy it now. If, it, if the numbers don't work, I won't buy it, but I'll just keep looking. Um, <clears throat> all right. I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to go like finish up just so people can hear me kind of finish this presentation. And I'm happy to stay on for another 30 minutes or so after this to answer any more questions you have. So that'd be great. Um, Leslie Fisher, hey Leslie, says, do you know of any pitfalls when starting with commercial lending? She says, I've purchased or, um, four single families with owner-occupied financing, so I'll be going toward, forward with commercial lending and want to do small multifamily, like 12 to 20 units. Um, yeah, so commercial lending, one of the pitfalls is just, it's not as good. <laughs> the terms are not as good. Um, I, I have a couple, we have, we have one commercial loan and you know there's a wide range of commercial loans like they're all over the board there are some long-term fixed mortgages on single-family houses in the commercial realm um, the, the interest rates are typically like what i've seen recently more like instead of four or five percent they might be like six or seven percent for a 30-year loan if you can get that like there are some companies that do that on small multi small single families and small multis when you get into the bigger multifamily there's sort of, the, I found there's like this window uh, of, of different lending changes depending on how expensive you get. And so like I have a property that is worth more than a million bucks and we've looked at refinancing that property with a commercial loan. And there are some really good like long-term fixed type commercial loans, but you had to have over a million bucks in loan, uh, loan amount. Like if you, if you were trying to borrow $600,000, you couldn't play ball with those, some of those commercial loans, those long-term loans. And so in that in-between zone, there were the loans were not as attractive for me. Like they would, you'd have to go to a local bank or a portfolio lender is what some people call those, and you could get like a three or a five year loan, meaning like it'd be fixed at a, a, probably a good interest rate for three to five years. But after that three to five years, typically, the lenders are going to want to have what's called a balloon note, and that's the pitfall. Like that's to me is like you want to push a balloon note means that you have to whatever you owe at that balloon date, which is usually three, five, seven years maybe, you have to pay off. Um, or refinance whatever you owe at that time. And one of the big, like the biggest risk in real estate investing to me is having to go borrow money during a downturn when nobody's loaning any money. That is, that I, I saw a bunch of people go out of business in 2007, nine and 10 um, because they had to do that, because they had balloon notes, because the banks were in control of their portfolio instead of them. And so like, that's my, that's the, my caution is like, it's not that having one of those loans is bad, but like you got to have a plan for what you're going to do about that balloon note. And I would prefer to have, if you're going to have a balloon, have it 10 years out, 15 years out, because at that point you can give yourself some time to get through a couple of real estate cycles. Um, if you do it three to five years out, there's a good chance you're going to be refinancing during a downturn. So when, when credit usually like uh, tightens up and so it's harder to get a loan during a downturn. So that's, that's my advice, Leslie, is just, Try to get to look at your options, talk to the commercial lenders, find out what's out there, find out what price you're going to be borrowing at to see like what's out there. And then be careful on balloon notes. Adjustable rates are a little bit risky as well, but I'd rather have a 15 year balloon with an adjustable rate after three or five years because you can withstand some high higher interest rates just with a little bit of negative cash flow. But when you have to come up with 200,000 bucks tomorrow or 30 days from now, that's a much harder proposition when there's a lot, not a lot of money out there. Hope that helps. All right, so I think Dwayne has a question too. I'm gonna go back to in a second on Facebook and then probably some other questions on Bigger Pockets and YouTube, but let me just finish up my chat on this mountain of climbing, of redefining retirement and thinking about your goals of retirement a little bit differently. So we just talked about early retirement and sort of what that means, particularly for people in the early in their life. Um, you know, you're not done yet, you've gotta keep climbing, but you can uh, make decisions based not on money, but on other things. And that's a really nice place to be. Traditional retirement is more about age. Like it could be like at any stage, if, if you get to the point where you're 59 and a half, you can start taking withdrawals out from your 401k or your IRA without penalty. So that's a really big deal. So that's, that's an, uh, one way you, you'll have access to some of these funds that you didn't have access to as easily early, earlier. So traditional retirement is defined by age in that respect. It's also the age, if you get to, I mean, it depends on when you choose to take it out, but Social Security could start any, sometime in your 60s, at least for right now. I think the long-term trend is to keep getting higher and higher on age for those of us who are younger. So, you know, if you're 20-year-olds, you're probably going to, if, if, I think it'll still be there, but if it, if it is, for them to stay solvent, um, it's going to be, you'll probably get it when you're a lot older than when I got it or when your grandparents got it. 
Um, and so traditional retirement means you have access to retirement uh, withdrawals, you have access to social security income, which is a big deal. Like if, if you can make a thousand or two thousand a month from your social security income, like that that covers a, it's a pension that covers some of your base expenses, and you can add that and diversify that with your rental income. And so that might mean the difference of you uh, being able to leave your job or not as a traditional age retiree. So um, the other thing I'll say about that, those healthcare, like I've mentioned that several times throughout this call, like when you are at least in our current healthcare health insurance environment right now, being an entrepreneur is sort of a gamble in terms of what your rates are going to be two or three years from now. Like uh, every year, the rates of health insurance inc are increasing, the cost of regular medical care is increasing. You know, I don't know, I have no clue where all that's going. I just know it's going up. And, and so when you have, and, and if things change and you have pre-existing conditions, for example, and if, if if the market goes back to the way it was before, it could be some risk there. And so when you get to 60, in your 60s, and you can start taking Medicare in the US, and the, in other countries, they don't have to worry about this as much, Canada and some other places. But in our, in our case, when you can finally get Medicare, that's at least a knowledge that, all right, I have health care. Um, there is some payment, there are some payments you still have to make, but it's sort of a, a floor for your, for your risk. Uh, one of your bigger risks is medical insurance and medical care. So. I think all of those go into traditional retirement. And so when you're planning, like if you are 50 years old and you're thinking about, all right, 10, 15 years from now, where am I gonna be? What am I gonna depend on? You know, you should definitely take those into account. The, the long, farther away you are, like I'm 38 years old, some of you might be in your 20s, you know, it's a little fuzzier on what it looks like, you know, 30, 40 years from now, but it's still something, you know, we are all gonna reach retir traditional retirement age. So you should be contributing to a 401k, a self-directed IRA, self-directed 401k if you can, are really awesome. Like I like to loan money out of those to independent, to like, it's a completely separate business. Like I have my rental property business and then I'll either make loans or be a passive investor. Like there's some entrepreneur who has a multi-unit property and needs some money. And I'll, if I know that person, and I know the deal, then I'll be the passive investor with them and they let them be the manager and do all that. And I'll put my investment, put my retirement money in with them and be that passive investor to make some long-term growth and income. And so use your 401k, use your self-directed IRA, even whatever age you are, contribute to that, max it out if you can. And then you'll be able to benefit from that once you reach retirement age, traditional retirement age. And so the, the peak of the mountain, I'm just going to say, is sort of what we started with is that, that goal of, if you could wave your magic wand and you had enough wealth and enough properties that you more than covered all of your personal expenses. So let's say you make you need 60,000 a year and you're making 70, 80,000 bucks a year from rental income. You know, you're you're in a really good shape. You you've got this nice stream of income from your rental properties. You've got a nice cushion. You're covering your expenses. Work is is 100% optional and you have some cushion there. So I think that's you know, my idea of financial independence. But I hope you've noticed from today's presentation that I think life has lived mostly along the way. And so hopefully we all get there to financial independence, um, but there's a lot of different milestones that are important. You can do what matters along the way. You can have live a good life. You can have fun. You can take many retirements. You can travel. You can change jobs. You can reinvent yourself. And all of this is possible because you're learning what you're learning in bigger pockets. You're reading uh, the book if you get the book. Like you're you're building yourself a foundation that allows you to make these choices that most people can't make. To be honest, I mean the the fact that we are talking about early retirement, not just retirement, you can use real estate to retire early. Like in your if you're 25, there's no reason you can't retire at 35, or th you have a really ambitious 30. It's possible to do that if you're 50 years old and you want to retire on your own at 60. Like those kind of 10 and 15 year horizons are very doable these days. If you are diligent, if you save, you focus, you buy properties, and you do a few, th you, you do a few things right, you can then have a lot of choices that are uh, other people don't. So uh, that's my message today. Y'all have been awesome, such a good crowd. I uh, love Bigger Pockets. You guys are an awesome community. Hope this has been helpful for you. My name is Chad Carson. You see my uh, Coach Carson shirt. That's, my, that's what I go buy online when I'm teaching uh, Coach Carson. I used to play excuse me, I used to play football in college like 40 pounds ago when I used to have like shoulders. And if you just want to look at my picture, look up Chad Carson football, uh, Clemson University, and you'll see some old pictures of me with a goatee and like looking me and like I was a, a middle linebacker kind of tough guy. Uh, but that's, I, I love teaching. I love sharing. Uh, I'm on bigger pockets. I wrote the book that uh, I've been mentioning to you, Retire Early with Real Estate. Uh, there's, there's some discount codes if you want to buy that. Um, just for today, you'll get it 10% off. And I would love for you to get that share and then 
let me know how if it helps you. Um, and I, I write on my own. I write at Bigger Pockets on their blog there. So check me out there. And then I write at CoachCarson.com as my personal website where I have a weekly newsletter. So if you wanted to come check me out there, uh, I'd love to connect with you. So thank you all for your, your likes, your thumbs up. Um, I'm going to stick around here a little bit longer, but I know you guys, some of you are at work and kind of sneaking this video in. So uh, if you need to get off and go, go take some, do some work, that's awesome too. Um, but I will stick around. I'm going to go back to YouTube now and answer some questions there. So let's see here. <clears throat> the man says, thank you very much. Where can we follow you? So hopefully you just heard, yeah, just at coachcarson.com is what my personal website. So feel free to check me out there. Uh, Jessica was talking about some Florida rentals, uh, 1800 for a one, one in a low income area over 2,500 is average housing market in South Florida is ridiculous. And to live, get into, if you're new to real estate investing. Yeah. Yeah. Proper prices are expensive, uh, compared to what people make in regular income around the country. I mean, there's a lot of money in Miami and South Florida internationally that's coming in. It's driving up prices. Um, San Francisco, Cal lots of places in California, prices are kind of disconnected from rents in some ways. And so you, you have to make some fundamental choices um, on where you invest. And I, I, I like investing locally because I think you have an advantage to um, competitive advantage and knowledge and areas and you can go check out locations. Um, but, you know, there's other options. You can invest out of state. Um, you know, the, the, another bigger pockets guy, David Green, I just actually got his book. I'm checking that out on how to invest long distance. So he's in San Francisco and invests in Florida and other places. So um, there, there's an option to do that in, in today, more than anything with technology and communications, you can invest in other locations. I think there's always a hurdle to doing that. Like I, I would prefer to start off on my first deal or two, doing a house hack, living in a property, getting creative. I think that's the, the best way to go. But um, you know, there's no reason you can't, if it, if it just is too big an obstacle to invest locally, you know, look outside of the, looks outside, outside of town. Um, one of my friends, Maurizio Rubio, who's on, the, um, who's on here earlier, I'm not sure if he's still here, he invested in Manhattan when prices were a little bit lower during the downturn, and it's kind of priced them out. And so he's doing vacation rentals like an hour or two outside of uh, the city. And so always you know, be, be looking for little niches. He's doing vacation rentals, which is a different niche. He's doing in different markets um, just you know, with an hour or two drive, but it's still sort of related to his core market, which is New York City, because there's people traveling for vacations on the weekends and during the summer. So if you can find some connection with your local market or find another market that you know because you used to live there, you have family or friends there, I find those like affinity markets to be the best places to really get started and, and where you're gonna be likely to stay and kind of be invested long run in that market. Jose De Leon says, I'm a newbie with a current credit score of 700 and a full-time student and full-time employment. What start would be recommended regarding purchasing your first rental property, a duplex or other multi-units? Uh, yeah, Jose, I would say like house hacking, like all the way. That's my first choice. Uh, I told everybody earlier, like that's the uh, it's house hacking and many retirements are my two like little stump speeches that I give all the time because I, I just think they're so helpful. If I could talk to every single person in their 20s or 30s before they buy their first home, if they would buy a either a house with like a rentable basement or rentable bedrooms or a duplex or a triplex or a quadruplex and do a house hack first, before you get into all like the dream home and the big old house and just living by yourself, like if you'll do the house hack first, you will be so far ahead of anyone else, even though it's not a race, right? But it's, you will be so far ahead of what you would have done if you just wouldn't bought that house. Like it's just, it's a really smart decision. You learn the business, you reduce your housing expense, you have a rental property if you buy it right, that you can then, once you move out a couple of years from now, you'll have that rental property to keep as a rental. So it's, it's one of the easiest ways to get in, into investing. And it's actually, in the book, I talk about um, kind of starter plans, and I talk about like core wealth building plans. And so for all of you who are just starting, like, I, I talk a lot about house hacking. I talk about a cousin of house hacking called live in then rent, where you live in a, like an affordable house, not your big house, but an affordable house, that even though you're not renting it out while you live there, but once you move out, you then keep it as a rental and you keep your mortgage, you keep your good, uh, the good property that you fixed up. And so like whether you do house hacking or whether you do live in the rent or whether you do like a live in flip where you like live in a property and then, then sell it every couple of years and benefit from appreciation that you've done fixing the house up and you benefit from tax free, you get a tax free sale if you live in the property for the first two, two out of the first five years. Um, that's an awesome deal. So. For many of you, you could just invest with your house that you live in. If you did nothing else but do that like two or three times, you would be in really good shape.
And so I, I would say keep it simple. Use your house as an investment. Do a house hack. Do a live-in then rent. Do a live-in flip. And that's it's also a little bit lower risk because you've got to live somewhere. And so as long as that property uh, meets your budget of your current job and you have a lot of margin there and you have an emergency fund, um, it's not as, as risky as going out and buying a new property and kind of being so aggressive. I think starting with your first deal as your home is awesome. Uh, Fast Roots Cloners uh, says the new fad will be tiny house parks. That might just be the new trailer parks because in some places you can't move trailers in per city code. Okay, yeah. We were talking about mobile home parks earlier and how that's affordable housing. And so tiny houses seem to be something that's kind of coming along. It's not something I'm familiar with. I, I, I know about tiny houses for sure, but I think the fact that they're affordable. Um, I've actually been reading about, you know, I like to read about future trends and there, there, um, there are things called 3D, 3D printers, if y'all have heard of that, where you can put any kind of material like cement, plastic, metal, like you can basically print a 3D object, like anything, really. And so they're, they're experimenting with 3D printed houses. I just I thought that was the coolest thing. And it could be like, if it gets, if they get it right, it could be really inexpensive um, to, to make, to basically print a house and particularly with tiny houses, it'd just be a little rectangle that you'd print out with this little, little this big printer and you think how many houses you could build doing that. Um, and so anyway, we all have to be looking at the future trends and noticing where things are going. John Rice said, is it profitable to get in an area where they're building houses for the first phase and rent it out and sell when they add on to the neighborhood? Uh, you know, I'm a little cautious on brand new neighborhoods. Um, but I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I, I owned a property that actually did well on, but we bought it in 2005 or six. And then we had, and they were still building out the neighborhood and 2007, eight, nine and 10 happened and nothing, you know, like there was, it was, it, there was just the whole, half the neighborhood was empty. And so it looked like a dead area, a dead, dead neighborhood, it looked like a zombie. They, sometimes they call those zombie neighborhoods and nobody knows who owned the properties, who owned those extra lots. The builders went out of business. And so there's some risk to new neighborhoods that are a little bit speculative. And so I would, I would just make sure you can go for the long haul. Like we, we had a good deal on the property, the cash flowed well, and we're now doing a lot better, but you need to be able to have some staying power. Like I, I think like buying at the beginning of a development and then flipping it like as the development goes up, I mean, people make a ton of money on that, I know, but it's speculation. It's not, it's not investing. You're speculating that the price is going up. Investing is looking at the income that property produces and saying it's, it's good enough to cover my mortgage, it's good enough to cover all my expenses, and I'm making a, at least a little bit of cash flow, a reasonable cash flow. Like That's investing. And if you want to speculate on top of investing and benefit from inflation and appreciation, that's fine. But always have a downside of saying, like, this is the worst case scenario, and I'm fine with that. So that's, that's my thought on the new construction stuff, John. Um, besides my own book, what's my favorite book? Austin Showman says. So yeah, my book, I like my book, but it's not, I wouldn't put it in my favorite. Uh, I, I recommend it to everybody, of course, but, uh, my favorite real estate book. Um, I always, I, the first book I always recommended to people for a long time is a, a mentor of mine named John Schaub wrote building wealth one ha house at a time. I, I like his perspective. He's been in Sarasota, Florida for 40 years. And sort of this mentality I've been talking with you about today of staying small and not worrying about buying a thousand units and taking over the world. I got a lot of that, I think, from John because he's been so successful making it big on these little houses, like little houses, and that they have allowed him to do all sorts of cool things for the last four or five decades. So I like Building Wealth One House at a Time. I recommend that one. Um, I like all of the, you know, the Bigger Pockets books. I haven't read all of them. I'm just checking out David Green's book. Uh, I like I like Brandon Turner's property management book. I think it's really good if you're into rental properties. Like you should get uh, that book for sure, uh, because he's got a lot of his systems and they're really good. He and his wife Heather wrote that. So um, those are two for uh, real estate investing, uh, and then for business, I've got a bunch. I love love a lot of business books, but my favorite that's made the biggest impact on me is a it's an old school one called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, it's just one I reread constantly because it's about not only like kind of how you think yourself, having being proactive and not like being a victim mentality of actually like thinking about how you can respond to the world instead of just being letting uh, everything else out there affect you. Um, it's kind of a personal like development book, but it's also about how to communicate with other people. For example, habit number four, I think is four or five is think when, when or no deal. Like everything you do, it ought to be like, hey, I'm sitting across the table from a person who owns a house. Like the first thing I always tell them is that like, you know, I'm here to make a profit. I'm an investor. But the bottom line is like this has to be a great win for you as well or we're not going to do the deal. Like I, I'll, we'll talk about your other options and I'm just one option 
and you just need to do what's best for you. And I hope that's with working with me, and if it's not, that's fine. So like that, that win-win mentality is so refreshing um, out in the world that everybody else is trying to cut everybody down and you know, be competitive. And I found it very, that people respond well to that when they know that you're sincere, they know that you're not trying to, that you're not trying to grab for every dollar, that like it's win-win, let's, let's, let's just make this happen. And, and so that's the mentality of that book. It's, it's got all sorts of gems like that. And so if you've never read that, go back and get Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's one of those that's on your shelf like constantly. It's, it's a really good book. Thank you for asking that, Austin. I'm a big reader, love, love sharing books. Uh, I'm out of the path of the hurricane, too. He asked me about that. I, I think. I need to check the news. I get kind of surprised by weather sometimes. I don't watch a lot of news. So, uh, but I have a lot of friends out of Myrtle Beach and Wilmington, North Carolina, that I'm worried about. So um, that's certainly something I'm concerned about at the moment. Uh, the man said, is flood and wind insurance worth having? I used to have it when I got in an accident, and they find the smallest things not to pay. Now it's hurricane season, and I'm not. I'm thinking about it again. I'd have, I'd have to defer that question to somebody else who's in a. I'm not in a hurricane area. I'm in the upstate of South Carolina, and so I just have normal insurance, and I don't get an extra wind and hail or kind of supplement. So, but I'd be curious to find out what people in Florida, uh, people in the low state of South Carolina, North Carolina do. People in Louisiana, Texas, where they actually have hurricanes pretty often. I'm not sure what the best practice is there. Awesome questions, YouTube. Let me look at um, Facebook, see if there's any other questions, and I'll be happy to answer those. And then I'm going to take go get some lunch. How about you guys? Uh, Leslie Fisher ordered the book. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate that. Good luck, and let me know if you have any questions. William Powers says, thanks, Chad. Dwayne Dudley says, I currently have five single-family houses. What's the best way to scale and get 10 more properties in five years, in your opinion? Um, so, you know, it's going to depend on your local, your location, like what inventories out there what types of properties i know for me like there's two parts of scaling like one part is the financing and having the money and so thinking about like where are you going to get the money are you going to be able to go get five more traditional loans are you going to need to use private financing or hard money like i used a lot of private financing where i just had an individual with an ira account or a 401k who would make loans to me and that's how i scaled that's how i grew more and so financing is the first thing i would ask ask and depending on what you have there, then it also ha you look at your local market and see like where are the opportunities. Like I, I've come to think more lately that the instead of like pinning and saying I want to buy multi units or I want to buy mobile homes or I want to buy single family or I want to buy this or that, like what you really should do is like look at the market, like look at what's out there, and and, and you should always be thinking about like where what are the opportunities now as opposed to saying like what's the best thing that somebody else told me in a, on a on a, a live stream or something, you know. Uh, your market's going to be a little different. And so start asking questions, start talking at local clubs, start looking. I, I'm always like a, I'm a kind of a detective of the tax records and seeing like, all right, so-and-so just bought a property for 50,000 bucks. And particularly when it's in my market, like if I'm hustling, and I'm looking for deals and I saw another investor bought a property, I probably know them and I'm probably going to send them a text and say, congrats, man, that was awesome. You just got that deal at a really good price. Um, but I'm also paying attention. So I know that they did that. And so I might find out something that, hey, look, so-and-so bought three properties at the foreclosure sale last month. Wow, like maybe I need to start doing the foreclosure sale. Or so-and-so got a deed from tax liens last month. Um, I need to check that out. And so like, be a detective where you ask questions, you look at the tax records, you pay attention to the, all the sold comps. Like if you have an agent, like get them to send you every single property that sold in your location. And don't only look at listed properties, like look at sold properties. And what you'll find is you'll see a lot of these other properties that investors buy. Uh, you'll also notice like flip houses. Like I like to see, okay, this house sold for 200,000 bucks and go look at who, and it looks like a flip house because it's vacant and it's staged well. So I'll go look at who bought that and what they bought it for and try to piece together the story. And so that's, that's my message is like to scale, you need to get the money and then you need to find a way, a niche that's going to actually have some legs. You'll be able to find deals in, in any market. And that, that has to do with being flexible and adapting. And I think if you do that, if you want to be flexible with what kind of property you buy and what location you buy, I think you'll then be able to chase the opportunities that, that come to you as they come. Good question, Dwayne. I appreciate that. All right, so we still have about 30 people on Facebook, uh, a bunch of people on YouTube. Let me check bigger pockets, see if there's any questions there. Uh, so I don't think there's any questions on bigger pockets. Make sure on YouTube. I said thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for your time. I'm going to close it down here in a minute. But just want to remind you, like if you are interested in the book, 
that's I'd love for you to pick it up. It's kind of it's, a lot of the topics I've been talking about today are in there and, and more details. And one of my favorite parts of the book was case studies. Like I love real stories. And so you're going to hear a lot about me, but I don't want it just to be about me. Like I, I got to interview all sorts of other people. I'm going to interview the, some people you probably know, like Brandon Turner, um, Paula Pants, another real estate investor and blogger. But I also inv and interviewed a lot of people you probably don't know who are just interesting stories. And I asked, like, how did you retire early? Like, how did you buy your rental properties? Like, what, how much debt do you want to have on your rental properties? How much income do you have? And so I asked all these detailed questions that are really interesting to know. And so you can get the concepts from the book. And then you can look at these stories and hopefully you'll find yourself in some of those stories and you can and you can look at them and say, all right, I, I'm going to learn something from that story and I'm going to apply it to what I'm doing right now. And so that's that was the idea of the book. I hope it helps you climb the mountain to an early retirement. I hope it allows you to do what matters, whatever that means for you. And more than anything, like I hope you'll let me know like how that helps you. Like if this has been helpful for you, like leave a message on here, say, hey, this has been awesome or like tell me what other, other things you'd like to hear about. And I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you're here in the middle of the day and, and checking me out and talking early retirement. Um, and I'll plan to do some more live streams in the next, next couple weeks as well from different topics in the book. So thank you all so much for being here and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.